y'all. Can you please brush your life? Well, good morning, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord. We've been talking about what it means to be a Pentecostal powerhouse. And I know I reiterate it every week, but you have this person who goes to the gym, he works out, he gets buff and tough, but it doesn't happen overnight. It takes effort, it takes work, it takes consistency. Constantly going through the same old routine, day in, day out, maybe week in, week out, focusing on different areas. But the point of the matter is, if he wants to become strong and tough, if he wants to become buff, he's got to keep at it. You don't turn into jello, into all muscle overnight. It takes work. The same is true when it comes to becoming a Pentecostal powerhouse. If we want to become mighty in the things of God, it's going to come only when we are exercising in the th spiritual things. If we want to learn how to pray, it's only there's only one way to learn how to pray, and that is to pray. If you want to become mighty in prayer, there's only one way to become mighty in prayer, and that is to do it day in and day out. If we have the baptism of the Holy Ghost and God moves with us in a certain area of our life to be used in the gifts of the Spirit, there's only one way to become more, I hate to say effective, but become more prone to using that gift, more... Uh, efficient in using that gift that we know that it is truly God and it's not, it's not us. How do we do that? By allowing God to use us more. If we're going to see the sick healed outside the walls, how's it going to come? When we exercise our faith and lay our hands on the sick and pray for them to recover. But all of it takes work. If we're going to become mighty in the things of God, it takes work. And we begin looking at how we become mighty in God. We looked at faith, and when we looked at faith, we saw that it is, it is necessary in every era of our life. And what is the enemy of faith? Doubt. Doubt. And how do we know that it's the enemy of doubt? <coughs> well, we can go back to when Jesus came out of the wilderness, that famous example that we love to use about casting out demons. Now, some kind don't come out by prayer and fasting. And while that is true, before Jesus even gave them that information, he said that this didn't come out because you doubt it. So doubt is the enemy of faith. From faith, we branch out into prayer. And if we really want to see God move in an area and become mighty in spiritual things, then we have to couple it with fasting. Once we do that, now we're starting to talk about the armor of God. And why is armor necessary? It protects us. We talked about that soldier last week. Why doesn't he go into battle with just a shield? Why does he put everything on? Because he wants to protect himself. He wants to protect the vital organs. Just because he has a shield doesn't mean that an arrow can't penetrate. Doesn't mean that someone can't uh, kill him through either a shot in the lungs, heart, liver, so forth. And when we looked at the word of God, how much armor does God command us to put on? If we go back to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, the very first phrase, how much armor does God instruct us to put on? What's that? The whole armor. So when we're looking at the whole armor, it's not you don't take just a half a shield, but rather you take the whole shield. He's talking about every single piece. And when we get down to it, God instructs us and gives us information and tells us to put on the helmet, Put on the sandals, put on the shoes, put on, take the shield, put on the breastplate, and take the sword. And he didn't say that you could leave any of it behind, but he said, put it all on. Why? Because a shield might be a little good, but it's nothing if you have a breastplate on. That gives you a little bit more protection. If you have the breastplate and no shield and no sword, well, all you can do is defend yourself. But when we look at the weapons and the armor, they're not just defensive, but they're offensive as well. Just a side note, as I was preparing for this, I was reading after a commentary, and they were saying that when you read the book of Ephesians and study, study it out, it's, the armor is that of a soldier who's prepared for close combat, not someone who's prepared for a combat way off 300 yards away, 
but someone who's battling, battling an opponent who's close to him. We talked last week how we have a real enemy. And not just one enemy, but we used the diagram and used the board to show that how many demons are there out there that's trying to take us down. There was no number given because there are countless. All we know is it was a third of heaven at the time, Lucifer drew. But when we start counting demons and narrowing it down to trying to come up with a number, the whole point of the diagram is to show that we're surrounded on all sides. There are millions and millions of demons. There are familiar demons. But it's not just the devil working alone. He has many minions, and they're all out to get us. And what does John chapter 10 and 10 state? That is their purpose. John 10, 10. So the enemy, what's his purpose? To kill. He's out to get you with everything he can. He's out to steal. He's out to rob you of your joy, of your peace, of your sanity. It's not just material gains. Yes, Job lost everything. But the enemy goes farther. And he's not out just to maim us. But he's out to destroy us. To take us down. Now, there are some Christians that the enemy knows that he cannot take down. But if he can hinder them, he will do everything he can to hinder them. We find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. And if someone else wants to read Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. Daniel 10, 12 and 13. 2 Corinthians 12 and 7. So what was the reason that the messenger is saying came against Paul? Because it's right in that verse. What was he trying to do? He wasn't trying to put him on a buffet. But he was trying to buff him. He was trying to hinder him. Prevent him from being effective. In Luke chapter 23 and 22, verse 31, we find the account of Peter where Jesus rebuked him and said, Get behind me, Satan. But what did Jesus tell him after that? Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. What would have happened if Satan would have been effective in hindering Peter? Who would have stood up on the day of Pentecost and began preaching that 3,000 got saved? Who would have went to the temple and saw the man there who was laying, get miraculous he miraculously healed? And roughly, I think it is said that 16,000 souls were added to the kingdom that day. Would anyone have stood up and been able to have so much of the power of God in their life that when they walked by, people would have tried to lay the sick? in the wake of their shadow, that it might cross over them. If the devil was able to hinder Peter, what lives might have been lost for the kingdom of God? Who might not have received their help? What advancement would the kingdom of God have had at that point if the devil would have been able to hinder him? What about Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 and 13? Thy 
before thy God, thy, thy word, word, for word, and I, and I am come for thy word. But the prince of the kings of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, he, but lo, Michael, one of the chief prince, came to help me, and I, and I remained there with the king of Persia. So we have Daniel. He's been praying and fasting for how many days? Twenty-one. Twenty-one days. And the prince of Persia was hindering his prayer. Who is the prince of Persia referring to in this passage? Satan, Satan one of his minions. The enemy has tried to prevent Daniel's prayer. But when did God send the answer to his prayer? From the very first day. But the enemy was hindering it. Sometimes the reason our prayers don't get answered right away is because the enemy is out to try to hinder our prayers. The enemy is out to hinder us as much as possible. And what would have happened if we would have kept pressing on maybe one more day of prayer? Or one more day of prayer and fasting? You know, the enemy is out. If he can't kill, destroy us, he'll hinder us in every way possible. Whether it be a demon sent to come against us in our times of weakness, whether it's an enemy that's constantly there persisting and nagging us, or maybe it's an enemy that's been sent to hinder our prayers to discourage us and think that God's not really listening. The devil will hinder us in any way he can think possible. But Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 11. Put on the whole armor, not part of it, because the enemy is real, and he's out to attack us on every side possible. But if we put on the whole armor, then we are able to stand against the wiles or the trickery of the devil. And notice he used the word wiles, which literally translates trickery. You know, the devil doesn't always come in a way that we would notice right away. He comes as an angel of light. Or he comes in a method or a manner that we are not likely to expect. And sometimes, he even disguises his voice in our voice. And we have to sit back and say, Did, was that thought really mine? Because if it wasn't, if it wasn't your thought, and it's contrary to the word of God, and it wasn't God's thought, there's only one other thought that it could be, or one other voice that it could be, and that is that of the devil. But we are to take on the whole armor of God that we be not deceived, that we might overcome. And when we put on the whole armor, we have a lot higher success rate than we do if we only put on the armor. Um, take on part of the armor. We've already said we can take the shield, but does that mean that no arrow will ever get past it and hit us? We can take only the helmet, but what good is the helmet if we don't have the breastplate on or a shield to prevent the attack? Or if the enemy is in close quarters, are we going to have the shield up, the breastplate on, the helmet on, and maybe the shoes that were planted there? But what good is defensive weapon? if we don't have an offensive weapon? Or what good is a shield if we don't use it offensively? We can have the armor. But Paul said, put on the whole armor of God. Not that we may just stand against the wiles of the enemy, but that we might overcome. A soldier doesn't take on his armor just to withstand the heat of the battle. He puts on the armor that he can become victorious. That he may win. Only a 
fool would go into battle with only part of his gear on. If we do not want to fall into the traps of the devil, then we must put on the entire armor. And I cannot stress that enough. And we saw last week that we don't put on just the armor to defend ourselves against one enemy. Because we have many enemies. Just because we don't see them, don't mean that they're not around us. Just because we don't see them, doesn't mean that they're not trying to take us down or working behind the scenes. Just because we don't see them doesn't mean that they're not trying to plant thoughts of doubt or fear into our minds. Just because we don't see them doesn't mean that they're working on brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so to come against us. We are to put them on the whole armor of God that we can stand against all the trickeries of the devil. And sometimes we'll be attacked on all sides. That's not something that we like to hear, but that's the truth of the, battle, of the matter. When you're in a battle, you're not just facing one opponent one-on-one -on -one -on -one and it's fair about game. But everybody else is coming around to try to kill you as well. Ask any soldier who's ever gone to war. Your enemy can be all around you at any time. It doesn't matter. But the goal is to become victorious. And the enemy that we're fighting is not visible to the naked eye because their bodies are spirit. Would someone please read Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12? Once again, Ephesians 6 and 12. And also 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 40. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 40. Before you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what does the first phrase within that verse state? For we wrestle not. I'm, you're not wrestling with me. You're not wrestling with sister so and so or brother so and so. The devil is <coughs> going to come to you in a visible form, more than likely. He's not seen. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against that which is tangible. What about 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 40? First Corinthians 15 and verse 40. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial one is, is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So when we look at the bodies that are defined by Paul, he says there are those that are terrestrial, fleshly, but there's also those which are celestial, spirit. Those are the ones that we are fighting, not flesh and blood, but their spirit. I've heard many, many preachers over the years preach about when God left the spirit world and Jesus came in the flesh. Personally, I don't believe that there is a quote-unquote spirit world. There are spirits. There are things that we may not see. But it's just the invisible part of God's creation. The wind exists. You can't see it. It's just part of, but it's still God's creation. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against spirit. And our enemies are spirit. And if our enemies are spirit... Then whether or not, and I, I'm, I'm sure it's not true, but King Arthur did not pull Excalibur from that rock. But even if he did, even Excalibur is not designed for these enemies. Any famous sword throughout all of history, or famous weapon throughout all of history, is not able to take down our enemy. You can drop a nuke on them, you can drop an atomic bomb on them, it doesn't matter. Why? Because our enemies are not flesh, but they're spiritual. Therefore, we cannot strap on a physical breastplate and a physical helmet and take a physical sword in hand and run against like, um, the enemy all their likings, swinging this sword. It's not going to be effective. It might be effective in getting you locked up in the loony bin, but that's another story. Why? Because our enemy is not carnal. 
And if our enemy is not carnal, then our weapons cannot be carnal. So they are spiritual. And God defines our armor. What is the sword that we use? It's not a physical sword. It is the Word of God. The Word of God is quick. It's powerful. Quicker than any two-edged sword. In fact, if we would translate it, that word quick actually translates to the word alive. It is more alive than a two-edged sword. We are to put on the breast, breastplate, and what is our breastplate? Bre uh, breastplate composed of of righteousness. But when it gets down to it, whose righteousness? God's righteousness. Why is it composed of God's righteousness and not our righteousness? Ours is flesh, and his is spirit. But there's a verse I'm thinking of specifically. The Bible defines what our righteousness is like. It is as filthy rags. Our righteousness is useless. It's worthless. To be honest, Brother Terry, our righteousness, if you want to put it in the physical, is not something you want to be cleaning a, a dipstick off to try to get an accurate reading. It's dirty. It's filthy. But God's righteousness is pure. It is holy. It is without spot. It is without blemish. There is nothing like it. It is the cleanest thing in the entire world <coughs> because it is God's righteousness. And then we take our shield, and our shield is composed of what? Faith. faith. And if our shield is composed of faith, then is our shield is determined by how much faith we have. Some people have faith in some areas, and some faith, people have more faith in the same area than others. But how much faith do we have in God? How much faith do we have that when the enemy comes against us, that we can quench every fiery dart of the wicked? You know, there are some things that the enemy can come against me with that my shield is up. If you want to imagine, it almost surrounds me entirely because I know that's the trick of the enemy. It's not getting through. It's not happening. Sorry, buddy, not today. But then there's other things, you know, that it's almost as if we don't recognize it and our shield's just hanging by our side and the arrows are just hitting our armor. Why? Because we lack faith in that area and we try to do things on our own when our faith needs to be completely in Jesus Christ. And then we're to put something on our feet. What are our sandals composed of, our shoes composed of? The gospel message of Jesus Christ. And when we are firmly planted in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are unmovable. And we'll talk about each one of these pieces a little bit more detail later, but those shoes that the soldier went into combat with, they weren't running shoes, they weren't tennis shoes, but rather they were more like cleats. They had nails in the bottom, so when the enemy came against them, they could plant them in the ground and remain unmovable. It gave them more strength, more sturdiness, more grip, more bite. And when we are firmly planted in the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we strap on those shoes, we are immovable. You know, the world's going to come against us with every wave of doctrine. And they might not always be blaming out, you must bow down and worship the devil. But they are little subtleties. Like the prosperity gospel. Blab and grab. Pray for the Mercedes and you'll have a Mercedes. Send me a thousand dollars and God will bless you with ten thousand. Those are false gospels. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is not something that we can stand firmly on. <coughs> but the shoes are designed that when we have the full gospel message, when we have the true gospel message, we can make, remain uncertain. You have any idea how many times at work I've been told that I'm not allowed to quote unquote spread my religion? I didn't even say a word. I didn't say a word. I then I got pulled off the side several times. Not lately, but within the years past. 
I could have let them persuade me. I could have let them let me, well, I gotta push this down a little bit. Or I can stand fast in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because when trust times come, they're gonna see who is in control. It is truly God. And it's not just that. We've seen that in the Bible. What happened with the lame man at the gate? Blue, uh, beautiful. 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 They saw him rejoicing in the temple. And what did the leaders do when they arrested John and Peter? They said, we can't deny what happened here. This was truly God, but we can threaten us. When we allow men to threaten us, we weaken the gospel of Jesus Christ in our life. But we need to stand fast and stand firm and arm our feet with the true gospel message and let it not be diluted or perverted in any way. For a man who had, or woman who truly has the gospel of Jesus Christ, they can't be persuaded. When they are set in the word of God, when it is set in their mind, they cannot be persuaded. Man may come against you and threaten this physical body, and they can beat you and they can torture you, but they can never take from you what is up in here. From there on, we have our helmet, and our head is protected with what? By salvation, our experience with God. Our, the fact that our sins are washed away. And there's one piece that ties it all together. And, the, our, and that is the belt. We are to gird our loins. And what is that belt composed of? It is composed of truth. And I don't know if we'll get there today, but... When you know the truth, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The truth is what holds everything together. When we look at this world, how many quote-unquote truths are there in this world? Depends on who you talk to, there are many truths. The scientists will tell you this, because to them, truth is the fact that the earth is billions and billions and billions of years. But when we study the Word of God, truth is that it's only about 6,000. Man, I'll tell you that this is truth, or that science is truth, and it, it could never be wrong. No matter how many times they go back and forth and they have to provide this test and that test, and this test is proven wrong, but that is truth. We can go to the Supreme Court Justice, Supreme Court. And they are the ones that determine the quote-unquote truth of the law of the land. And I think it was Sandra Day O'Connor. <coughs> she had a test for everything. And this case would come up, and, it, and she'd come up with a test, and this was the way that it had to be. But then they come up with a similar situation regarding the same topic. She did another test, and it went the other way. Her tests weren't accurate. Truth to man is relative, but when it is founded on the word of God, truth is unchangeable. For years and years and years, if you go back to 1492, or even let's say 1487, what was the truth concerning the world back then? It was flat. Columbus, don't you go too far that way because you're going to fall off the face of the earth. It is no. It is truth. If they would have read Isaiah, they would have known the truth concerning the shape of the earth. That it was round. What do we know is the truth today concerning the shape of the earth? That it's round. You go out and tell somebody on the street that the earth is flat, they're going to tell you that you're nuts. If you would be back in 1490, you would have fit in with the crowd because the earth was, uh, was black, and that was the truth. That was all there was to it. In man's eyes, truth is relative. It changes. And why? Because man is the one who determines what truth is.